Today what I want to go for are the ears, and the ears have two main functions, one for hearing and one for balance. So we'll start off with hearing and then we'll go on to balance later. So the ears have three kind of main components. So first the outer ear, then the middle ear, then the inner ear. And starting off with the outer ear, then we'll go to middle, then we'll go to inner and see how different components work. So firstly, the outer ear kind of consists from what you look at an ear when you can see it on someone's head, this bit kind of here, and then the tube here. Then you've got the middle ear, which is these kind of bones and stuff. And then the inner ear, which is a lot of stuff kind of happening over here. So we'll take it one by one. So starting off, here's my attempt at drawing an outer ear, or what you see with an ear. And if we just label it, each part kind of has a name. So overall, this whole thing is called the oracle. That's what you see. Um, if I just write that down, oracle. Um, yeah, I don't know if it helps. Oracle and oracle are two different words, but maybe it helps you remember that uh, in Greek mythology, the oracle of Delphi, the oracle that kind of told prophecies and you'd hear them. I don't know if that helps you remember it, but they're not the same word, so I'll get rid of it. So starting off with kind of labelling it, your ear kind of has funny shapes. The way that that works is because sound is a wave and it just is a longitudinal wave and it just helps and makes the sound come in as best as possible, basically. Hence all of the weird bumpy shapes and stuff. And each of them have a name for you to remember. Try keeping it simple. So this one here is called helix. And then you've got helix, you're gonna have an anti-helix. Then you've got this bit here, which is kind of the flappy bit that you feel just there, which is called tragus. And if you had a anti-helix to your helix, you're gonna have an anti-tragus. This kind of Thing there that's called the external acoustic meatus. So external acoustic meatus, external meaning outside, acoustic sound, meatus just meaning tube. And obviously if you have an external one, you're gonna have an internal one. The internal one's obviously inside, and that has the cranial nerves going through them. So we'll go through them. So one is the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve seven, and then cranial nerve eight, which is the vestibular cochlear nerve, also goes through. That's made up of the vestibular. So that's related to the balance of the hearing, and then the cochlea, which is related to the sound, and we're doing the sound right now. Um, and then overall, kind of this bit here is called the concha. Because that's kind of like a quick overview of what, there's more to labelling it, but that's just like the simplest way of kind of going the key main points. Um, you can also divide the ear into quadrants, like that, and make it a bit thicker, and then you can see it there. Okay, you can divide it into quadrants, and they have different sensory supplies. So this bit up here is like C2, that's like the lesser occipital nerve. Here, this bit is like V3, so that's the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve, so V3. This bit here is C2 and C3, so the spinal nerves. And this bit here is the facial. Cranial nerve seven. Uh, you also have like going like deeper into like the external acoustic meatus and kind of around the ear, uh, facial and vagus branches kind of like innovate the deeper aspects of the oracle and the external acoustic meatus. And that's why people might cough if you put if they put their finger really deep inside their external acoustic meatus. And that's because the, the cough vagus nerve also innovates the back of the throat. So that's also getting activated. So that's basically that uh, in terms of the ear. If I don't now get rid of... Just move that over. I'll just move over there. And quickly draw a small diagram. So... When you continue past, that's what we've done so far, and now we're going deeper in here. Now, what you're going to first thing, first thing you can see is the eardrum, or the tympanic membrane. So, what you're going to see with that is basically a sheet, it's very like you can see light through it, so, and then you're going to see this kind of shape there. 
So what you're going to see is this bit here, this bit that I've kind of drawn is like bone. So this is the lateral process. This bit here is the handle. And this bit here is the umbo. And this is made up of the malleus. I'll get onto the malleus, but it's one of the bones coming up next. What you also have is kind of a cone of light. So when you're looking inside you someone's ear, you'll be able to see this. Cone. And then the rest of this bit is just called the pars tensor. And that's basically what you'll be able to see. So let's now just kind of get rid of all of this. Oh. And then go on to the middle ear. So now what we're looking at is this word. This word, the ossicles. That's made of three bones that we'll look at here. So middle ear, like I said, main three bones that you know are the malleus, incus, and stapes. Malleus here, incus here, and then stapes, that bit kind of going there. What happens is sound enters the ear through you know, because of it as a longitudinal wave coming in through the ear or the oracle, travels down the ear canal, which can hear, and then vibrates the tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane, uh, tympanic membrane will then vibrate the malleus, which will then uh, vibrate the incus, which will then vibrate the stapes. And that, that's basically it. So the way I remember it is MIS, like MIS, uh, malleus, incus, stapes, and that's the order. Um, so and these, yeah, they're just called the ossicles. So if I just write that down, which is just the ear bones. One of the things to bear in mind with the middle ear is that you also have this thing called the acoustic reflex. The acoustic reflex is basically a way for your ears to protect themselves when you hear a really, really loud noise. And so what it does is you have two muscles, like one called the tensor tympani. And one called the stapedius. So like, for example, um, you yeah, hear really loud, a really loud noise. You want to prevent damage to your ear by hearing that really loud noise. Because some, you know, if you hear a really loud noise, it hurts a bit. So your body protects itself from that, preventing damage to the ears. So what happens is the tensor tympani and the stapedius, these are just muscles that are connected to malleus and stapedius is connected to stapes. Muscles innovated, so tensor tympani by the tensor tympani nerve, which is quite easy to remember, which is just a branch of, um, from the mandibular branch, so V3. And then stapedius is connected to stapes, and that's innervated by the facial nerve. So what you can then see is that if it's a really loud noise, they're innervated, and they will then just pull on those nerves, preventing you hearing that really loud noise. And that's just what the acoustic reflex is. The other thing to bear in mind is that you have um, mastoid air cells, In the middle ear, like around there, and what can happen is, well, not there, sorry. right kind of there, um, these can get inflamed, and that leads to mastoiditis, which is inflammation of the mastoid air cells. Other thing you can see is this bit here, which is called the eustachian tube. The eustachian tube connects the middle ear to the nasopharynx. And what it does is it just equalizes the pressure of the middle ear to the external acoustic meatus. So when you go up in a plane, you probably notice a bit of pressure in your ear. And then like you might maybe like suck on a sweet or you might try like almost like blowing your nose. What that does is it just equalizes the pressure there. Um, yeah, one of the other things to bear in mind about the eustachian tube is that here you can see that it's at quite an angle like that. So this is probably for an adult. For children, it'll be a bit more like that. So it's uh, shorter 
and they're straighter. That means that they're more likely to get upper respiratory infections and also like um, middle ear infections, like because it's easier for microbes and stuff to get in. One another pathology to bear in mind for the middle ear is this thing called otosclerosis. So this is just the fusion of the um, oscles, so the malleus, incus, and stapes. They just fuse. If they fuse together, that means they can't vibrate, which means that you're not going to hear. This is going to come up later for Rene and Weber's test, and when you're trying to differentiate between like conductive or sensory neural hearing loss. Okay, let's go on to the inner ear. So the inner ear is basically made up of two kind of parts and that is outer ear, sorry just get rid of that, that's wrong okay so what you got here's the inner ear now you've got this bit here this bit here and these bits here so what we're going to look at first is this yellow one this is called the cochlea and then these two go together and those are for balance, so vestibula. This is called the vestibule and these ones are all called the semi-circular canals. So what we're going to do is focus on the cochlea. So the way that the cochlea works, as you can see it's this kind of like spiral shaped thing. Uh, it can be a little bit confusing looking at this. So I'm gonna try drawing it out and keeping it as simple as possible. <laughs> Probably seen quite confusing diagrams that look a bit kind of like that. And then there's one component there, one component there, and then another one in the middle. Gonna keep it really simple. So think of the cochlea as just a tube that's just wrapped up like that, as you can see in the spiral. Just unwind it. So now you've gone, rather than it being like this, you've just gone like that. And you've just unwound it. Now, now that you have just a tube like that, fold it in half like that. And that's all we're looking at. Now we're going to then basically just wrap it around a stick like that so what you get is kind of something like that and that's basically what the cochlea is this stick is called the modiolus so mod modiolus and then these are the tubes that we'll go into and see how they work so hopefully that makes sense of what the cochlea is it's just a little bit confusing so if we redraw our tube in a bit nicer of a way. This is what our tube looks like when we fold it in half. On the one hand, end here and then one end here, you've got windows. Which way round does it go? This is the oval window. And this is the round window. What happens is you have uh, the sta uh, stapes bone, so malleus incus stapes, stapes at the end there. That's going to be vibrating against the oval window. What happens after that is you have a fluid that goes all the way around here, like that. This is called perilymph. You just need to know that this has low potassium uh, concentration, so it's higher in sodium. So perilymph travels all the way around this tube. Now, two different names of this tube. Uh, at the end here, it becomes this thing called a helicotrema. Don't worry about that, that's just the apex of it. Um, and that's the, kind of the division point. So from this point, you got one name for a tube and then the other name here. This tube is called Scala vestibuli. And then this one is called this 
Scarlet Symphony. So that's how to remember that. The way I remember the difference between oval and round, which one comes first, is just by the word or. O, R, like either or. Um, so then oval window, round window. And the way I remember the difference between Scarlet Vestibuli and Scarlet Tympani is the word that. So Vestibuli and then Tympani like that. Hopefully that helps remember it. We'll put it all together again though to see how it all kind of fits together. Okay, so what you now have is just vibrations going this way and then that's just causing this fluid to be vibrating like that. But how does this help us here? Well, this is kind of where all of the complex stuff happens in this middle bit, the scarlet media, or like the cochlear duct. What you have is this thing here called the bacillar membrane. So the bacillar membrane just sits there uh, in the scarlet media. And what you've got on top of it are hair cells, like this. I'll just go all the way along. Okay. And then I'll just put some pink ones in as well, like that. Okay, what you've got there are hair cells. So. And then what you've got on top of that is another membrane, which is called the tectorial membrane. So, now basically what happens is as the sound is coming, or as the fluid, the perilymph is kind of flowing all the way through here, it's causing vibrations. That causes the bacillar membrane to vibrate along here. So as it's vibrating, these hair cells will then move. And they will come into contact with the tectorial membrane. These will then kind of push on the hair cells, and the hair cells will open. And then if they open, ions can enter and then cause depolarization, sending off the signal to the cochlear nerve. Break that down a bit more. So basically just membrane vibrates, activates hair cells, passes on information. Breaking that down a little bit more, what you have is the, in this area, so we said perilymph travels in the ducts here. What you have is this other thing called endolymph. Now the important thing about endolymph is it's high in potassium, um, potassium ions. So that's the difference between perilymph and endolymph. Um, quick sidetrack actually. All of this kind of exists within the bony labyrinth. So if we draw like a cross section of it and call this the bony labyrinth, this then is the membranous labyrinth like that. And what you've got is endolymph sitting inside here with high potassium. And then over here is the perilymph with low potassium. And so then that means what you're going to get is perilymph over here, and then inside here, endolymph. So hopefully that explains the difference there. But yeah, just endolymph, high potassium, perilymph, low potassium. Now, why is that important? So, the bacillar membrane will vibrate at different, uh, based on the different frequencies. So, if you think of the bacillar membrane a bit like a diver's flipper, so a bit, oh, it's going to be a really bad drawing, and they put their foot in there, like that. When they put their foot in there, this bit is going to, this bit is really stiff, right? And this bit is really bendy. So if we call, if we just label it, this bit as the apex, and this bit as the base, and then relabel it the same way, apex, 
and base. What you have uh, at the base is where you're going to have higher frequencies. So think of like an opera singer, something like that's really high, like very, like singing a very high note. And then the apex is where you're going to hear a lower, like a lower frequency sound, like over here. So think of someone with like a really deep voice, you're going to hear them there. And then depending on the different frequencies of the sound, you're just going to hear that along there. The difference between frequency and amplitude. Amplitude, if we just draw a kind of like graph, right? Amplitude is just how loud it is going up and down, right? So that is louder than that. But then what's the difference between frequency? This would be a low frequency and this would be a really high frequency. So that's the difference there. So at this end, you're just going to have, at the apex end, you can have lower frequency, so a deeper voice versus here, a higher voice at the base. And that's just how, think of it like a flipper. So yeah, that's basically what happens there. If it's like a, for example, like, a very high voice at this bit this part of the basilar membrane is going to be activated this is going to start vibrating what's going to happen there is these cells like these hair cells are then going to come into contact with the tectorial membrane and be activated if they're now activated what's going to happen is they will now open their channels and what we said is endolymph has high potassium. If they're now activated, they will then now allow the potassium to enter those hair cells. So just kind of like, if we zoom in on this bit. Um, so here's our cell. There's the tectorial membrane. And there's the basilar membrane. As you get vibrations, it opens. There's high potassium because of that's endolymph over here. That's now going to enter this cell because it's now been activated. This, how you get an increase of positives, this will now depolarize this cell. This cell is now depolarized, which means that's kind of more an action potential can happen versus hyperpolarization where no action potential can happen, right? Because now the gate's open. The other thing that happens though is another ion enters, which is calcium. Now, what do you remember about calcium? Calcium is used for exocytosis. It's going to bind to a vesicle, which contains glutamate. Glutamate is then going to be released, which is then going to activate the Cochlear nerve, and that's basically how the and all of this is just called the organ of corti, and that's basically how the organ of corti works. So yeah, um, hopefully that will make sense. But if you don't remember it, just this vibrates. So is this? Oh well, no, the basilar membrane vibrates, activates the hair cells based on the frequency, uh, low and high opens up the channels, high potassium from endolymph enters, so does calcium, activating the cell, and then it releases glutamate, activating the cochlear nerve. That information then can get passed on. What then happens next after the cochlear nerve? Well, this is where it gets... Oh, so first, actually, there's the reason why, going back to why I put two different colours for the hair cells. You've got two different types. You've got inner hair cells and outer hair cells. So inner hair cells, let's go inner hair cells versus outer hair cells. Inner hair cells are passive. So as they kind of come into contact with the tectorial membrane, they'll just be activated. So the movement of the basilar membrane, so a mechanical movement, will then cause an electrical transduction. So that will then go on to the brain versus the outer hair cells, these are now active, which is so an electromechanical transduction. So the movement of the inner hair cells will activate 
the out hair cells causing them to then move. So it's electrical, then it's mechanical. Um, and basically what the out hair cells do is they just amplify the sound. And so it boosts your sensitivity to hearing. So then uh, type one auditory nerve fibers synapse on inner hair cells, that's like 95%, versus type two auditory fibers synapse onto out hair cells, about 5%. Um, type one and type two auditory nerve fibers combine together, which then form the cochlear nerve. Yeah, um, so just write passive and active. So out hair cells just increase and amplify the sound that you can hear. Uh, out hair cells can get damaged by like antibiotics, for example, like vancomycin and gentamicin. Um, if someone presents with this, like hearing loss when they're on these drugs, stop the drug. Um, this isn't medical device though. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, the sensitivity of the ear is then going to drop because you've damaged the outer hair cells. And then you just lose sensitivity. So, what you then have is, going back to the cochlear nerve, what happens next? Well, once you've got the cochlear nerve, where's it going to go to? It's going to go to the cochlear nucleus. After the cochlear nucleus, where is it going to go to? It's going to go to the superior olivary complex. I'm just going to go through this quickly because there's already another video on the auditory pathway, but just a quick overview. So superior olivary complex, that's going to then go to the lateral lemniscus. And then from there, it's going to go to the inferior colliculus. From there, the medial geniculate body. And there, it's going to go to the auditory cortex. Okay, let's just see how this all fits together now. So cochlear nerve sends it to the cochlear nucleus, which goes to the superior olivary complex goes to the lateral lemniscus, inferior colliculus, then medial geniculate body, and then auditory cortex. Difference between, you have two geniculate bodies, one's a medial, and then one's obviously then going to be lateral. Difference between them is medial is for the auditory, lateral is for the visual. How do you remember it? Music, medial, lateral, light, visual, auditory. One of the things to talk about for the inferior colliculus, though, is that it's also very close to the superior colliculus. So if we just draw a little loop over here and draw out our superior colliculus, what you have is this is now related to the visual pathway. So the superior colliculus is related to eye movements. How does this help? Well, when you're hearing a loud sound, you'll look towards it. How do you know where to look? Well, that's related to this. What you have is the rostral part so rostral rhymes with nostril that's how i remember that bit and then the opposite of it is caudal then you've got medial and lateral so yeah like i said rostral rhymes with nostril which means that your nostril your nose is at the front of your face <laughs> it's terms from like embryology so if you're struggling with like difference between rostral and caudal rostral nostril at the top of your head caudal like called it equina like tail at the bottom uh, so rostral sounds coming from in front. So then that means caudal, just the opposite, would be sounds from behind. Um, lateral, lateral low, so sounds coming from below you. So, and then medial sounds coming from by, uh, above you, high. So you basically just need to remember rostral in front of you because your nose is in front of you, and then you'll figure out caudal is behind you, and then lateral low so sounds coming from below you you look towards the sound coming from below you and then medial high so this is just in relation to your eye movements eye movements you just look towards a loud sound inferior colliculus is for the auditory pathway superior colliculus is for your eye movements so that's all i we don't go over on the auditory pathway but hopefully that helps but with also the superior olivary complex it helps with like um interoral time difference so basically just working out kind of where a sound is coming from because there's the distance between your ears as well but yeah 
um, hopefully that kind of makes sense. We'll go back onto these parts of the like of the ears and everything. So the vestibule, uh, the vestibular system. So we'll start off with the vestibule and then the um, semicircular canals. So let me just copy this picture. <laughs> Okay, so the way the, basically, what you have is the vestibular system. Vestibular just means balance. So your ears um, help you not only hear as we've gone through, but they also then help you balance. How do they do that? Well, that's with these bits. What's the difference? This then divides into two. So you've got the semi-circular canals and then you've got the vestibule. Vestibule, we can divide into two bits as well. The utricle and the saccule. Overall, what's the difference between these two? Well, the difference is that the vestibule is for linear acceleration, while the semicircular canals are for angular acceleration. And what does that mean? Well, let's say it's basically just telling you kind of how you're moving. So linear acceleration, it's kind of, you can go up and down. So let's say you're in a car, you're driving in one direction. Your head is stationary and you're just moving forward. Um, and then another way is, for example, you're in a lift and you're just going up. But your head is stationary, but you're, you know that your body is going up um, and you're accelerating. Angular is the semicircular canals. So the semicircular canals, you've got three of them. And then each one kind of corresponds to um, one of the different head movements. So you've got three different head movements. So if you shake your head side to side as though you're saying like no that's one of them then if you're nodding as though saying yes that's another one and then the other one is if you try touching your ears to your shoulders back and forward that's the last one so that's angular because like you're moving your head at different angles while this the vestibule doesn't it's linear head straight um like i said so linear if you like the example of a car versus a lift going horizontal or vertical how do you tell the difference? So utricle and saccule, they work in the same way. There's just, there's a difference between the, the vertical movement and the horizontal movement. The way I remember it is the word hut, like that. So horizontal utricle, and then saccule begins with an S and it just reminds me of snakes and ladders. So in snakes and ladders, you've got the different stuff and you've got a ladder kind of going like that and a snake going like that. And you just go up and down with the snakes and the ladders just make you go up and down on the board. Well, hot, horizontal, each call, so and snakes and ladders, saccule. So hopefully that helps you remember the difference between them. Okay, so going into we'll start off with the semicircular canals. So if you think about the semicircular canals as tube like this. Like this. Here's the semi circular canal and this kind of like bulge bit is called the ampulla. Or the ampulla. Um yeah. So basically what you have is fluid going around here, like before, like we said, um, and then kind of stuff happening here. Fluid moving affects stuff happening here. So the fluid is um, an endolymph traveling through here. And then some stuff happening here. What we'll do is we'll zoom in. 
and here and see what's going on. You have draw some cells. Like this, and then this kind of gel like substance here. Okay. Okay, so this is basically what's going on over here in the ampler. So what you have is this kind of gel-like substance, which is called a cupula, which is, yeah, just a gel-like structure. And then you've got these hair cells over here. So you've got two types, one called the kinocilia, and then these red ones called the stereocilia. There's more stereocilia than kinocilia. The way I remember it is kind of is bigger, so it's the king, and then the stereocilia is the subjects. There are many of them. You've only got one king, you've got many subjects. What happens is as you move your head, this will then cause fluid to then move in these semicircular canals. The duct moves, the fluid stays uh, behind. Well, so as you move your head, obviously the um, semicircular canal will be moving overall and the fluid stays still behind, doesn't move. It's then going to affect the cupula. It's going to flow this way or that way, depending which way you're moving your head. And then that's going to basically brush and move these stereocilia either towards or away from the kinocilia. If it moves it towards, the stereocilia move towards the kinocilia, there's excitation. If they move away from the kinocilia, it's inhibition. Um, where I remember it is the subjects love their king and they get all happy and excited the closer they get to their king but you know they get all sad and inhibited when they move away from their king so yeah um if they're excited then that information then will just be passed on to the vestibular nerve and then that will then join with the cochlear nerve to make the vestibular cochlear nerve cranial nerve eight and that will go through the internal acoustic meatus. So like you've got an external acoustic meatus, internal acoustic meatus as well. So hopefully that makes sense for the semicircular canals. Now with the vestibule, the way that, that works is in somewhat of a similar way um, in terms of with like the hair cells and stuff. Okay and then Yeah, uh, same kind of way. The difference is is that you've now got these kind of like almost like um, ear sand, kind of ear rocks, kind of thing that go like that. Um, this is called otoconia, and what happens is as you you're moving either up or you know vertically or horizontally. These oticonia, made up of calcium carbonate, will basically brush against these hair cells, and then that will just tell you how you're moving and how you're accelerating. And then that will then be passed on to the um, to the vestibular nerve. So that's kind of how the vestibular system works. What we'll do now is just go over the difference between Rene's and Weber's test. So this is like clinically important so and can kind of come up in exams quite easily. So okay, Rene's versus Weber's. Firstly, we need to then before we can get into the test, we need to know what we're testing for. So if we actually move this stuff down because otherwise you, there's no point in doing a test if you don't know what you're testing for. So there are two terms, conductive and sensory neural. So conduct, conductive hearing loss. Okay. 
versus So conductive hearing loss is basically when there's damage to any part of the ear that's involved in transmitting sound waves. So this is like the external ear or the uh, um, middle ear. So for example, like otitis externa, so otitis meaning related to the ear, but inflammation of the ear because it's itis. Otitis externa, otitis media. And um, like I said before, um, otosclerosis, so the fusion of those um, of the bones, so malleus incostapes, uh, earwax or damage to the eardrum. Each of these will be conductive because the transmission of the sound wave isn't working for some reason. Sensory neural, it's basically when there's damage to any part of the ear involving transmitting the electrical impulse. So this is basically then almost the inner ear. So there's some kind of problem later down the line. So from um, the inner ear onwards, basically, it's some kind of wiring problem. That means that you can't hear anymore or you're, there's damage to your hearing. So an example of that is like Meniere's disease. Uh, which is increased in like endo length and then you can test that with like an audiogram so um, in an audiogram you have like the normal baseline of zero decibels on the y axis and then frequency on the x axis so kind of like that that's what you've got for like um decibel and then your frequency there um normally if that's like sorry I said that's normal at zero. That would be normal hearing. Anything that you go below here is when it's get worse, worse and worse and worse. So mild, then moderate, then severe, then profound hearing loss. Uh, many years disease is basically when there's a problem with your hearing at um, lower frequencies, but then it gets better. So yeah, so like, um, tuners pressing on the auditory pathways, for example, like. Um, Acoustic neuroma, uh, antibiotics damaging the hair cells, so that's the outer hair cells can be sensory neural uh, damage to cranial nerve eight as well. So yeah, this is basically the difference between conductive and sensory. So now we know what we're testing for. Conductive basically damage to, for example, just like the transmission of the sound waves versus sensory neural transmission of the electrical impulses. So now we know what we're testing for. Let's figure out what the difference between relays versus Weber's is. So the way I remember Renee's is, is ring Renee. So where do you put a phone? I like think of like an old kind of phone. Um, you put it next to your ear, right? So that's basically where you're going to put your tuning fork. So you're going to put, well, you're going to use a 512 hertz tuning fork. Tuning fork. Um, what you're going to do, you're going to bang the tuning fork in your hand or you're going to pinch it. You're going to make it vibrate. Then you're going to place it um, on the mastoid process, which is kind of the only bit on the back of, like just behind your ear. So like we saw, said before, mastoiditis, um, inflammation of the mastoid process. Um, just Google a picture of what the mastoid uh, process looks like. You're going to put your tuning fork there. It's going to vibrate. And that's testing for conductive um, uh, conduction, uh, bone conduction, sorry, on the mastoid process because you'll put it on the bone and the, the vibration will go through the bone. Then you're going to then put it next to the person's ear, so like still in the air, and you're testing then air conduction. And so then what that's basically going to tell you is a positive Renee's test, so positive Renee's equals normal hearing. Normal hearing, i.e. air conduction, is better than condu um, bone conduction. Greater than bone conduction. So that's basically what Renee's is. That's what it's, and you just you know, ask the patient which is louder, bone or conductive. Then what you got is Weber's test. So let's just move it over. What you're still gonna do, same, 512 hertz tuning fork and what you're going to do is you're going to put it on someone's head <laughs> so if we draw someone's head like that and say there is a there 
You then get the, your tuning fork like that, and put it on, make it vibrate, put it on their head. Um, and it's now vibrating. The way I remember this is it kind of makes you look like a Teletubby, but I don't know why, so hopefully that will make you remember where to put your tuning fork, make you look like a Teletubby, put it on your head. Um, the way I remember it is Weber's begins with a W, so if you're testing your ears, you've got two ears, and then you've got the tuning fork on your head, so it goes like that, which forms a W, so Weber's test, and then ring Renee, you're putting it next to the ear. Um, yeah, so then, if we, how does Renee's work? Tuning fork vibrating, putting it on the head. Normal hearing should be, it's equal both, like in both ears, sound, heard equally loud. That would be positive Weber's test. Negative is when there's some kind of problem. So let's say in this ear, the patient says it's louder. Now, there are two possible reasons why it could be louder. The first reason is this, you put it now, the tuning fork, on someone's head. So it's on their bone, which means that there's bone conduction. That bone conduction will vibrate down here and appear louder. So the first one is bone conduction in louder ear. So it's just amplified there, right? Um, now, what's the other reason why in this ear it could be louder? Because also, yeah, so this ear is, air conduction isn't working for some reason. You need to then figure this out using Renee's test. So you need to use them both together. Um, air conduction isn't as good as bone conduction. It works better on bone conduction, so it's more sensitive. It picks up more sound through vibration. That's the first reason why this ear could be louder. The other reason is is that there's a problem around here. So there's a sensory neural hearing loss on the opposite ear. So for some reason, and we all need to investigate why, the sensory neural, sensory neural hearing loss in the opposite ear. What this means is that this ear will appear louder, not because this ear's got any damage or anything, it's just because this ear, the wiring that's gonna send it off to the brain isn't working. So that's why everything's going to appear louder in here, and there's a problem here. That's why you now need to do Renee's to figure out where's the problem. And you need to do Weber's with Renee's and Renee's with Weber's. So they go together. So the second reason is sensory neural hearing loss in opposite ear. So that is now Renee and Weber's test done. Um, we've covered quite a lot. <laughs> um, what I want to just go back to quickly is this kind of stuff, starting basically from how sound enters. So we know that sound enters going into here, into the ear canal with the tympanic membrane. That's fairly simple. Then it starts to get a little bit more harder to remember what happens with in the middle ear to the inner ear, and then from the inner ear to the auditory pathway. So what we're going to try doing is coming up with a way to remember it. So the way I remember it is, let's get rid of this. The way I remember it is, Miss or vet, and then it's E. coli M. A. <laughs> yeah, so each of these now stand for something. So if we just write out Malleus, Incus, Papies, Oval Window, Round Window, Scala Vestibuli, Scala Tympani, 
then you've got so this one doesn't work as well but um, let's kind of go with it uh, this is for the cochlear nerve there's a lot of ease in cochlear nerve so So there's a lot of ease, hence that. Um, then it gets a little bit better. So then you've got the cochlear nucleus. So then you've got the superior olivary complex, lateral lemniscus, and then the inferior colliculus, medial geniculate body, and then auditory cortex. So hopefully that is a way to help you remember from here here onwards um yeah